Now in my previous video, I built this uh, pin diode based uh, transmit receive switch. And I used some pin diodes that I picked up in a collection of parts in a ham fest and they were just unlabeled just as pin diodes. No markings, there's no markings on the components. So I wanted to verify that they were indeed pin diodes. And uh, a way to do that is to take a look at the, the device capacitance as well as the uh, reverse recovery time. And uh, so while doing that I thought well maybe a video on diode reverse recovery time would be a good one to do. So that's what we're going to talk about today is the reverse recovery characteristics of diodes. So what is the diode reverse recovery time? Uh, when a diode is switched from forward to reverse bias, a reverse current actually flows for a short period of time. Now, a way to kind of illustrate this is let's say we had this switch thrown to this position here. We're sending a positive voltage you know, through this current limiting resistor through the diode. So the current through the diode is shown like this. When the switch is thrown in the opposite direction, um, you know, to essentially have a negative voltage applied to the diode, you say, well, it's going to act like a diode and it blocks all the current flow. And that's true but not instantaneously. What happens is, is that there's a reverse current that flows. Sometimes it can go down and be current limited by the voltage and uh, the resistor. Sometimes it might just pop down and then recover back. So you actually get this reverse current that flows where the diode doesn't block like a diode for a short period of time. Now this is due to essentially the stored charge in the PN junction. Uh, when the junction is forward biased, there's a space charge that's built up around the junction that uh, basically allows the junction to then conduct. Uh, when you reverse the bias, that charge has to be removed and then essentially carriers have to recombine to reform the depletion region which causes the diode to block. And this doesn't happen instantaneously. Well, the reverse recovery time can range from a few nanoseconds or less to, for high speed switching diodes to a few microseconds or more for you know, high power rectifiers or even pin diodes. So the reverse recovery time is going to depend very highly on the particular device and what its application was designed for as well as the current levels that are involved. You know, for a given device, if we operate at a higher uh, forward current, the reverse recovery time will be longer because there's more space charge that has to be removed. So we'll see that the reverse recovery time is proportional to the forward current. It's also proportional to the amount of uh, voltage applied in the reverse direction, so how quickly we can remove that charge. So testing for reverse uh, recovery time you know, is going to be very highly, highly dependent on the test setup. Now many of the manufacturers of diodes, when they specify reverse recovery time, will also include you know, what their test configuration was. So, uh, so the values that are in the specification table are all really only going to apply under those specific test conditions. So the, the little test method that I show here might not match the results uh, of a, a line item in the data sheet because this test setup that I use here might not match what the manufacturer used when they actually made that characterization. So why do we care about reverse recovery? Well, if you had a diode that had a lot of uh, a long reverse recovery time, that could be a significant source of loss in like a switching regulator where we want to snap the current off very quickly. It also could be a source of inaccuracy of a peak detector where if we're trying to put charge onto a capacitor to measure the peak uh, voltage level, if there's any reverse current, then that would bleed charge off of that capacitor and cause an inaccuracy in that measurement. So there can be you know, some reasons why you'd want to think about um, what the reverse recovery is in your application. There can be some benefits too. Uh, it can be beneficial in some signal switching applications. And again, if we take a look at uh, my video on pin diodes and RF switching, we'll see that, that that stored charge allows us to use the diode to switch RF currents uh, even when those RF currents and voltages would normally reverse bias the diode. We're taking advantage of the fact that the diode is still conducting even when the voltage across it is reverse biased to be an effective switch. So there's pluses and minuses to you know, the effect that we have here. Now as I mentioned, uh, different manufacturers will have different test setups for measuring uh, the reverse recovery time. I'm using a very, very simple setup here just to show the effect. I've got a pulse generator that's set up to um, you know, output a, a pulse that goes from a negative voltage starting off at say minus one, going to plus one, and then going back to minus one. I've got it set up for just a few microseconds of width. 
The pulse generator itself, uh, like most uh, function generators, has essentially a 50 ohm output impedance, so that's going to tend to limit the current. Uh, we're going to basically just send that directly through our device under test, our diode that we're testing, and go into a 50 ohm termination. In my case, I'm using the 50 ohm termination that's built into the scope, but if your scope doesn't have a 50 ohm termination that you could turn on, you can use a real just a 50 ohm termination, a 50 ohm resistor, um, and probe it with say a 10x probe with your scope, or use a 50 ohm feed through termination right at the input of the scope. So this is the test fixture I use for testing devices like this. It's just a pair of SMA jacks soldered to a piece of uh, scrap circuit board. I used an X-Acto knife to kind of hog out, uh, you know, essentially a conducting strip between the two connectors and hogged out a little bit of the center of there to create two little isolated strips. And I soldered in a couple of just pin sockets, a couple different sizes that make it very easy for me to take a device, you know, and stick it, uh, you know, into the socket to make measurements. Now with a piece of wire inserted in my uh, test fixture, uh, we can easily see the applied pulse that I'm going to be putting essentially through the diode. So in this case it's starting off at uh, minus one volt going to plus one volt and that's looking into 50 ohms. Of course when we go through the diode, the diode drop and things like that are going to make these voltages uh, change, but that's okay. We're just going to use this as a, uh, a quick way of visualizing the reverse recovery effect. Okay, so if I move my shorting wire here and let's replace that with uh, the first device we'll test is this little uh, power rectifier diode. We stick that in here. We can now see that effect of that reverse recovery. Now the horizontal uh, scale here is about 400 nanoseconds per division, so we've got probably about a microsecond or so for this thing to kind of get pretty darn close to being off. Now, of course, that's all going to depend on the bias conditions. We're looking at about uh, oh, 600 millivolts or so. Uh, in the forward direction here, that's 600 millivolts across the 50 ohm termination. So, you know, 10 to 12 milliamps of forward bias. And then when we go turn off, we can actually see this is going down to, you know, about 1.3 volts or so. Uh, so we've got 25 or so milliamps uh, going in the reverse direction for a little while. And then we can see a tail off back to zero. So if I increase the forward bias, that will increase the amount of charge that's stored in the junction and make a correspondingly longer reverse recovery time. So let me increase that and we can actually see that effect. The forward bias is increasing, that re reverse recovery time is also increasing. So we can kind of see how that uh, effect works. Also, if I uh, increase the negative bias, make it more negative when we turn the device off, we can remove that charge quicker. So if I grab the low level and make it lower, we can actually see that the peak current uh, gets high, higher, but the reverse recovery gets a little bit shorter. And if I decrease that reverse bias, we can see how the reverse recovery can take very long. So increases in reverse bias can tend to shorten the reverse recovery time. And of course this is all dependent on the particular devices used. So let's take this rectifier out. If I put in this guy as a 1N4001, we stick that into the socket here. We can see it's got a slightly different characteristic, a little bit longer reverse recovery time. Doesn't go quite as deep in terms of uh, you know, the, the peak reverse current. I've got another even higher power diode here. This one's similar to a 1N4004 I believe. And we can see that, uh, again, just a little bit longer, you know, in the uh, reverse recovery pedestal. But then the recombination time is a little bit faster uh, in terms of that exponential, you know, kind of decay, decay here. So all these devices behave a little bit differently. Uh, I've got a, uh, uh, an unmarked uh, glass uh, switching diode here. And if we stick that in the socket, we can see that its reco reverse recovery time is actually much shorter. In fact, we can zoom in on that and get a better feel for that. So that's about 40 nanoseconds of division now. So say 40, 80, you know, you know, 1.2 or you know, 120 nanoseconds. You know, that one's basically pretty much off. So it's uh, probably an order of magnitude faster than the uh, the switching diodes that, or excuse me, the rectifier diode I was showing you earlier. Now, high-speed switching diodes that are designed specifically for that, things like a 1N914 
I've got a very, very fast uh, reverse recovery time. So if we stick that diode in here, we can see that uh, I can barely see what's going on here. But if we zoom in, okay, and i got to zoom in even further on that. Let's kind of center that up or so and zoom in on that. Okay, so now I'm at four nanoseconds of division. And I can see that, uh, you know, I'm recovered, you know, from going through zero and recovering back up again in about four nanoseconds. Okay, so very, very fast in terms of its reverse recovery characteristic. And that's typical of like 1N914 or 1N4148 that are designed for high-speed switching applications. Now, Schottky diodes, on the other hand, uh, since they don't have a PN junction per se, they don't have the same tr stored charge. So if I stick this uh, 1N5711 Schottky diode in there, we see just a very slight undershoot here, and that's probably more due just to you know, reflections and stuff in my fixture as opposed to any real reverse recovery. Now let's kind of go back and take a look at uh, you know, the original reason I started playing with, around with this fixture was to take a look at the reverse recovery of these pin diodes that I used in my uh, transmit receive switch. So let's see if I get that to sit in the fixture here. So I can see here now, if we zoom in on this here, that uh, the reverse recovery of this pin diode is on the order of, let's see, there's about, there's that 40 nanoseconds of division, you know, so 40, 80, you know, about uh, that same 120 nanoseconds. But I can see the recombination time is actually really pretty quick on this. And uh, so this, really, this kind of long duration here where we're just current limited by the uh, source and load, is, uh, is really what's advantageous for us in the RF switching application that I use the pin diodes for. That and the low capacitance you know, when the device is off. So I hope you learned a little something about what reverse recovery is in a diode, a quick way to measure it, and you know, some of the conditions that affect uh, how that reverse recovery behaves. Thanks again for watching. Comments are always welcome, and uh, see you next time.